Nobody wants to get united. Like, what we got to do is meet everybody in 149th Street at the bench. Hey guys, welcome back to the bench. Today we have a graffiti hand style tutorial. And in today's video, I'm going to teach you guys the basics of tagging. One of the very first things pretty much every single new graffiti artist does is they add way too much style to all of their work. They overcomplicate things. That just gets in the way of the fundamentals. This makes learning pretty much impossible. Because most new graffiti artists, they come in with this kind of notion of how graffiti should look. And they think it has to be crazy and wild and super stylish, so they try to implement all of that into their work without really understanding how letters function. And as a result of that, they end up messing up all of the fundamentals. And this prevents them from ever actually practicing the basics that they need to. You see, style is the ability to illustrate the fundamentals properly, and then exaggerate those fundamentals the way you see fit, the way you like. But those fundamentals still have to be present, and they still have to be correct. Otherwise, all you have really is just mistakes. So let's start in a much more refined way. We're going to keep things basic and begin using our basic structures, also referred to in other font-based art forms as the skeleton hand. Essentially, this is the letter in its most simple form. It's what you're going to use in order to learn how to do the font-based art form, in this case, graffiti. From there, we move on to this chart right here, and this is really where everything begins. You see, this line right here is called the baseline, and think of this as the floor for your letters. This is where all of your letters are going to stand on. Now, this line here in the center is called the mean line, and this is roughly speaking where the center of your letters is going to land. Now this line here at the top is called the cap line, and you'll want all of your letters to touch this cap line. When you do this, it'll ensure that all of your letters have the same proportions, and are the same size, and as a result, have similar or comparable amounts of weight to them. If you follow this chart right here, you really shouldn't be having any issues at all with your letter name weight and your proportions for your letters in general. And it applies for hand styles, throwies, as well as pieces. Now you might notice I left out two lines here, the one at the very very top and the one at the very bottom. The one at the very top is called the A sender and the one at the bottom is called the D sender. In graffiti, both of these areas are kind of reserved for extra details. Things like underlines, halos, exterior details of any kind, and if you're doing other forms of graffiti like throwies or pieces, then that'll be reserved for drop shadow 3D and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, more advanced graffiti artists will have their letters dip into the A sender or D sender as well, but remember, we're keeping things simple here. So for our purposes, we won't be utilizing these. But but you still have to understand and know about those two lines. An important thing to understand about graffiti is that graffiti treats all letters as uppercase letters. So if you're doing, for example, something like the lowercase g, instead of going from the mean line to the baseline and then down into the D center like it usually would, it instead is going to come from the cap line to the mean line and then back down to the baseline. Now the reason we do this is to make sure that our letters not only maintain their proportion, but they weigh a similar amount and they have comparable sizes. If we don't do this, and we allow lowercase letters to be treated like lowercase letters, then they lack a lot of weight and they have a ton of negative space which comes with a bunch of other issues. While writing, make sure your lines are nice and clean. Focus on getting refined shapes. That's going to be very important for your letter structures. This will ensure accuracy with your lines and as a result, your letters will look more refined as well. If your letters are made from sloppy lines, then those lines are going to create sloppy shapes. And if you have sloppy shapes, well then you're going to have sloppy letters. I can't tell you how how often I see this in brand new graffiti artists work. So set aside time in order to practice lines. Just lines. Nothing crazy, no letters, just lines themselves. This is where we move on to the topic of flow, a topic that a lot of new graffiti artists struggle with. And if you want to learn everything there is to know about this topic, pick up our brand new book we just released in the description down below. It covers all of graffiti's fundamentals and makes learning graffiti really easy. It'll transform how you think about and how you do graffiti. It's no exaggeration when I tell you guys that my glossary alone in this book has more information than any how to do graffiti book on the market currently. It truly is the ultimate graffiti guidebook. If you're keeping things simple and practicing the basics, then your letters will flow automatically without you having to do anything about it. The only time flow ever gets disrupted is if A, you've messed up one of the fundamentals, or B, you added too much style and as a result, messed up one of the fundamentals. That's the only reason flow ever gets messed up. So if you're noticing that you're having an issue with flow, check your other fundamentals in graffiti and make sure that you've got those down pat. Another thing we have to keep in mind when you utilizing this chart is the actual tool that we're writing with. You see, because if we're using something like a ballpoint pen here, it's got a pretty fine nib. And that means if we do a hand style that's really large, then we're going to end up having a lot of negative space because this nib is simply too thin for that size of a tag. On the other hand, on the other extreme, if we do a hand style with a massive nib, but we do that really small, then we're going to run to the opposite issue where our hand style is too small for this large nib. Both of these have problems. One has too much negative space, which makes your letters look 
disjointed and weak, and the other one doesn't have enough negative space, meaning your letters look smothered and they lose letter structure as a result of that. This topic is known as nib width, and you'll want to use a nib that's appropriate for the size of the tag that you're doing. That covers the basic gist on how to use this chart. Over time, you want to commit this chart and how to use it to memory, because you're not going to draw this chart every single time you want to write your name, obviously, right? So you're going to want to keep it in the back of your mind and envision it whenever you write your name. Try to get used to doing that as you practice. From here, we move to negative space management, and this is a very, very important topic when it comes to graffiti in general. Now, in other letter-based art forms, negative space management is known by a different name, that being kerning. Kerning describes the space between two individual letters. As to where in graffiti, negative space management includes not only the space between your letters, but the space inside of individual letters, as well as the space any of your extensions or exterior details also create. And typically in graffiti, in order to help manage our negative space, we like to overlap our letters very slightly. As you can see in this example right here, when we overlap our letters too much, we begin to distort letter structure. It becomes harder to read individual letters. That becomes very problematic, because if you cover important structural points of a letter, well then you might end up destroying that second letter. On the flip side of this, you don't want to position the letters too far apart, because then each individual letter looks like it's part of a different word. So in graffiti, we like a slight overlap. Nothing too crazy. Enough in order to make sure that the whole word reads as a word, but also not too much because we want each letter to have its own individual space and structure. So a very modest overlap is perfectly good. Now that we've gotten through all that, there's different kinds of letter structure that we should be talking about here. Earlier we mentioned the basic structures, the letters in their absolute simplest form, but there's another type of letter that's slightly more advanced, and these are called variant structures. My book has a complete list of all variant structures for every single letter. Now variant structures are alternate ways to write letters. They still don't have any style implemented, they're still in a simplistic form, and all variant structures flow naturally with all basic structures. So what's great about variant structures is they give you an alternate way to write a letter, a different starting point if you will. Maybe you got a lot of triangular shapes in your letter, but you come across an R and you're like, man, I really wish there was a way to write that that was a little bit more angular. Well, there is. That's what variant structures are for. Some letters have plenty of variant structures. Things like G, S, E are great examples of this. They've got a ton of variant structures. While other letters that don't have any variant structures, things like capital H or O have zero variant structures as well as X. What's important for a beginner to understand about variant and basic structures is that together, these two come up with a category called base structures. And these are gonna be letters that universally flow with one another and they're used as your starting point before adding style to them. You wanna practice with these base structures. This is gonna be what you focus on as an amateur. If you can understand basic structures, then you can begin to move into variant structures. And once you understand variant structures, you can begin to kind of alternate between the two and stylize both of them. But that only comes later down the line once you've understood all of graffiti's fundamentals. But dudes, if you wanna learn more about graffiti, check out our comprehensive how to do graffiti book in the description down below. The Ultimate Graffiti Guidebook. It truly is the best how to do graffiti book on the market. If you're looking to understand how to evolve and get a style, if you're looking to understand flow, if you're looking to understand how letters function, you're looking to learn variant structures, it's got all the answers in there. So if you practice along with the book, you'll get out of the toy phase, no doubt about it. Or if videos are more so your thing, check out the best how to do graffiti playlist where we cover all of graffiti's fundamentals right up here with more graffiti content right down here. And I'll catch you guys back here next week. Thanks for watching.